Hello, everybody. Uh, thank, thanks for coming back. <laughs> um, I'm starting to recognize folks from last time in the public meetings. Uh, it's nice to see that you're um, sustaining interest in, in, the, in the effort. I think it'll, it'll be very worth your while and your community's while. Um, so last time we, we had a, a, a whole bunch of meetings. We got together. We came up with some starter ideas for the downtown, which we, which we went over in, in detail last time. We'll, we'll kind of recap that at the beginning. And then we're going to look at some of the, um, what we're calling the earlier stages in, in a, little, uh, a little more fleshed out way. Um, so you're going to see a little bit of a, a short version of what you saw last time with a few new things that we learned along the way added in. And then we're going to talk about, um, let's say, Lafayette and Williams area. We're going to talk about the Leaper Park area. And we're going to talk about, what's the name of the street again? Jefferson, <laughs> there's so many streets. Um, the Jefferson area, um, and, and some broader ideas for the, for the downtown today. I just want to start out by thanking you guys for, for coming to the, to the charrette and the workshop and helping us um, last time and this time. We've had a lot of people from the community talk to us about the parks and the streets. And we do appreciate the skepticism that uh, the mayor was mentioning. Um, we had a lot of feedback about the park, for example, and we incorporated all those ideas into our thinking. I think you'll see a, a big change in our thinking this time. And we also did the same thing for the streets. And you know, we've been around the block a few times, like was said, but we don't know your city like you guys do. And so it's really great to to um, listen to all of your ideas and visions, and then and you help us draw something that's what we call context sensitive. So I think it's getting better and better. But I'd also say that there's still um, a lot more to be done. These are still um, being just getting started, and there, there'll be a, a longer process to get this, this done. Um, so that this won't be the last time you see these ideas either. I think we'll save the questions to the end, if that's OK. Otherwise, we're never going to get through. Just by the agenda, so there's probably eight hours of stuff to share with you which we're going to try and do in an hour. Uh, so you're going to see the highlights. There'll be a lot more detail in the drawings for those of you who, who, who see the drawings, but we can't go over everything. And then we'll have a, a question and answer th period at the end with some discussion, um, flesh things out. Um, so I'm Ian. Um, Andrew is going to be talking to you about the Jefferson Corridor. Um, Claudia and Sarah worked up a lot of the street designs. I'll be going over those with you today. And then um, Kevin and David are our park planners, and, and David will be talking about the Leaper uh, Park area. So you, you'll see three of us uh, up here. Um, just So starting with the recap part, we, we, we toured the city last time, and we went on some, a number of field visits again um, this trip, and we, we met with lots of people. And then this is, this is the um, rat's nest that we created of maps and plans, and people came in and, 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 and helped us. So it, it was a very busy place down at the, um, at the Charette Room. So today we're talking about smart streets and parks. Um, there's a lot of dimensions to the streets. They're not just, uh, everyone keeps focusing on the one-way to two-way conversion, but there's lots of different layers in, in the aesthetic, in the parking for the businesses, in, in the, the bicycle accommodation. Uh, in the identity, uh, wayfinding ease. So there's, there's lots of things that add up to smart streets. And the streets are the biggest part of your public realm. Uh, they should be community spaces. They, they should be um, uh, equitable and inclusive. And then parks are the second biggest part of your public realm. And uh, they, they, they kind of go together. They kind of connect. And so we're going to show you ideas for both. So just a few of the. Um, the ideas, street trees are very important for, for comfort on streets. Both these streets are the exact same width, but one's comfortable and the other isn't. And it has a lot to do with the um, street trees. So you'll be seeing street trees in a lot of our, our images. Uh, being able to ride your bike. Uh, this is a busy road. It has some roundabouts. But being able to bike your, ride your bike comfortably along the street is important. There's all sorts of different types of bike facilities, and some um, attract a, a bigger population of potential cyclists than others. This you still have to be a, 
pretty brave rider to ride in, in, in a regular bike lane. But this, just about anybody will ride in. You're on the, the friendly side of the, the parked cars. So if you want to stop at a shop or, or stop at a bike rack, you can. And then at the intersections, the, the bike lanes come back you know, through like a normal bike lane through the intersection. And that way drivers can see you. So when, they're turning, when the driver's turning right or left, they can see you. So you can get through the, the intersection safely. But for the balance of the time, you're in a very comfortable area. And then when you get across the intersection, you go back again behind the parking and the trees. So you'll be seeing some of these sort of higher level bike facilities in the plans. Our main um, route for the bikes through downtown is, uh, we're proposing will be Main Street because it's so wide we, we have the space. But all the streets will be um, uh, bicycle friendly. So pro providing a nice bike facility, a nice sidewalk, on-street parking provides some comfort for the pedestrians. But in some enclosure with the trees and bringing buildings up to the street with awnings makes a very comfortable edge to the street. And comfort is one of the key things that we'd like to see uh, more of in, in your downtown. One of the things that makes the street uncomfortable today is that you've got several lanes going in the same direction. And so when that happens, you can see speeding and weaving and so forth. Now, when we were um, driving around in the downtown, we noticed, especially going south down Main Street, all we were focusing on were the signals, you know, making sure they were green. We weren't even looking at the businesses and so forth. So we'd like to change that environment a little bit so that you know, people will notice the businesses and the displays and, um, and all the opportunities that the, the downtown provides. We're going to be looking at a number of roundabouts. And there were some um, myths in the, in the community about roundabouts. So I thought I'd go over a little bit of information about roundabouts. So roundabouts are pretty easy. Every turn's a right turn. You turn right into the roundabout, and you turn right out of the roundabout. Um, there's very few crashes at roundabouts. They're very pedestrian friendly. So you cross to the splitter island, and then you, you cross. So you're only crossing typically one lane at a time. And on bigger roundabouts, maybe two. But it's much easier to cross than at a signal. So we're using them at schools and so forth. The other thing is you don't have the clutter of the signal up in the sky. So it, has a, a beautifying element as well. These make great entrances into downtowns, so you can come in. Um, and once you go through the roundabout, the environment changes, and you're, it's sort of a physical indicator that you're in an area that you might want to shop or watch out for pedestrians, that kind of thing. So this is a, a street which will, this carries more than your streets will carry in the future. So this is a, a busy street in California, and um, here's, a, here's a lady riding through one of the roundabouts. This street used to be a five-lane arterial, and it, it was the signals were replaced with roundabouts, and it became a two-lane street with arterials, carrying just slightly over 20,000 cars a day. It's very easy to walk across a roundabout, like I mentioned. So you cross the splitter island, look the other way, and cross to the other side. Uh, delivery vehicles, buses, emergency services can get through roundabouts easily. They come in all kinds of shapes. So here's one at a, an interstate. Instead of signals, they did this big roundabout here, but it's kind of an oval about. <laughs> this one is like a barbell about. With, so it's sort of stretched through like a balloon, like you squeezed a balloon. This is a peanut about. Anybody recognize where this is? This is near here. Carmel? Yeah, Carmel, yeah. So they've got a whole series of these um, down there. And so there's one here, one here, one here. And so if you want to get some good um, information about roundabouts, they've got lots of them in that community. And it seems to be working really well um, processing the cars and for safety. So the public space. Uh, streets really ought to be public spaces. And, and I guess that's a public space, but it's not a very comfortable <laughs> public space. So there's, there's Main Street. It's, it's not very friendly. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's really about just getting the cars through uh, quickly. And I think we can, we can raise the bar on the design there. This is also a Main Street. Uh, completely different design, though, and um, probably carries about the same number of cars, but it does lots of other things, too. Um, dining, um, art, tourism, it does all sorts of things really well. So the idea is that all the types of streets we're talking about need to be able to accommodate the motorists. They need to be accommodate the cyclists and pedestrians. Now, both your streets and the street I just showed you accommodate these, but one accommodates them comfortably and the other one doesn't. And so the idea is to accommodate these folks uh, comfortably and then nurture these things with the streets, to have a relationship between the street and the land uses so that the, 
the institutions, the housing, the businesses, and the recreation areas can, can meet their potential. The capacity of the street in, in my profession recently has been defined as how many cars can cross a line in, the, in an hour. And if you recall from last time, we talked about streets having the capacity to encourage recreational activity, to, to be places for socializing, to nurture businesses, to be great addresses to live on. So streets have the capacity to do all sorts of things. And, and in the downtown, it, they have the capacity to do so much, to, to create the, um, the, the heart and soul of the community. And this is where South Bend started. It was right here where the old uh, manufacturing was. And it's got the old historic buildings. It's got the great grid network. It's got so much going for it. We just need to get the streets to, to be more inclusive of different, um, different ideas. We showed you last time a series of um, flush streets. So this goes to the far end of being inclusive. So um, this street is up in, I'm only going to show you examples, by the way, from places that get snow. Because last time I was criticized because <laughs> I showed you places with palm trees. People, people said that doesn't apply here. So, <laughs> Um, so all these examples are cold places. So the, the, the image I showed you last went from was a Scandinavian country. This one is up near Toronto. So here's a flush street by a university. And so the students can cross this very busy street um, very easily. And this is a street that leads to the, I think, the third most successful mall in Canada. So that's, it's a pretty busy street. This is a street that we're just designing now. This is at Central Michigan University. It's a, there's a city street going through here. This is the new library. That's the student center. So it's one of the busiest streets for, in the area for car traffic and for pedestrian traffic. And we're going to do one of these um, complete shared smart streets right, right here. They, they get plenty of snow as well. Um, connected streets. We went over last time about how there's lots of ways to connect your, your city together. And so you've got all these different ways of connecting streets. Now when you, t one way these streets, it's like taking away half of your network. Uh, you can only go north on half the streets. If you want to go anywhere, you have to go quite often out of route to get there, uh, backtracking. When we met with the fire department, that's a, an issue for them. They would prefer to be able to go directly to their, um, their location. And, and so would I as a shopper, for that matter. We talked about um, sharing loads and um, spreading out the traffic on many streets so each one can take its load. So if you have lots of two-lane streets, as opposed to a few you know, four or six lane streets, it's a lot easier to walk around. So getting from A to B is a lot easier by crossing lots of little streets than a couple of barriers, um, kind of like climbing big stairs compared to um, normal sized stairs. We reviewed in detail last time about what walkability meant. And this is kind of key, fundamental, um, fundamental thing to your downtown. The most important thing for walkability are, are people comfortable? You know, are, kids comfortable? Are elderly people comfortable? Are, are, are ladies comfortable? Are, is everybody comfortable using your downtown streets? And comfortable means that you, you're, not, you're not anxious, you're not feeling um, unsafe. And then we like streets to be engaging to sustain people's interests so they're willing to walk far, that they can actually use the space that is accessible. And then for your downtown we want things to be convenient. So this, this means that you have the density and mix of uses so that when you're downtown you can, you can park your car, you can get out of your house, and you can do lots of things while you're there. And then connected, is, it goes back to the connected street network and, and trail system. And if you have all those five things, you'll have a, a vibrant downtown. This is just a little data about, because um, there was some, uh, again, some healthy skepticism last time about the, um, the effect of two ways and one ways on businesses. And here's a sample of, six communities, but dozens have done this sort of thing. And you can see that the, the vacancies were before ranged from 6% to 80%, and afterwards went from, um, sorry, yeah, they all, all the vacancies, um, the, the businesses filled up. So now there's only like 80 to zero or 20 to 15. So businesses filled up as, um, as the streets were one way. There were some questions about was, was it the one ways or is it something else? Well, some places, um, restore their two-way operation just with paint. So it, it's really just about the um, improved access to businesses and so forth that help the businesses. Other places they beautified and so forth at the same time. So it was a combination of things. But the common denominator is the improved access to the businesses uh, that help the businesses thrive. 
a little bit about mixed land uses and densities. You remember, you remember this cartoon that this guy's average trip length shrunk by 85% on the weekends because he has everything he needs within about three feet. <laughs> so the idea is to bring everything you want in, that you need in, into your downtown so you don't have to go very far. It's to reduce um, average trip lengths. And so this is what we do uh, when, we go, uh, when we go on trips. About 20% of our trips have to do with work. And then 80% of our trips, the majority of our trip making, has to do with all these other things, shopping, going to the dentist, recreating, going to school, and so on. So if we can get these things in our downtown, then you'll see a lot more um, short trips and a lot more vibrancy. So this is a small town, Main Street, and you can see you've got housing and a, and a whole variety of, of uses on the ground floor. And here's a big city with the same sort of pattern. So this works at small, with small cities and with big cities and everything in between. If you recall, we talked about uh, the big roads in the cities and how a long time ago, every street in the city, whether it was an arterial or a local, operated at four to six miles an hour because that's how fast your horse walked. And so it didn't matter what street it was on. Uh, that was the same, you had the same speed. So this is a busy road, but it's very pedestrian friendly. There's retail up to the street, there's housing. A very vibrant place. Now, in modern times, since about the Second World War, we thought it was a good idea to speed these roads up. The idea was that as an individual, we'd like to get from A to B faster than before. That was thought of as, as a good thing. So if it worked for me, then if we got everyone to go from A to B faster, it was, it was a good thing. So if we sped up everybody on the street, but what happened was the pedestrians started to feel uncomfortable, the retail success started going down because their access was diminished, and this became, the housing didn't want to be there, and this became a barrier in the community. And crossing Main Street is a, somewhat of a barrier to a lot of people. Um, and so we find ourselves, through design, uh, getting the streets to operate at, at more human speeds, slower speeds, safer speeds, so that pedestrians feel comfortable and are, are more willing to cross the street and walk along the street and shop just like they had for hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is a model of a, a city from uh, a long time ago where this is downtown with their most valuable land. Then you have the second most valuable land and then it gets lower and lower values as you get out of town. And everybody wanted to be close to the middle because that's where the action was. That was where things were happening. That was where the most social exchange and economic exchange were happening. So value was a function of proximity to the center. So where you are mattered, location, location, location. So that, that was the way cities worked for, for a long, long time. So this is what I'm gonna call traditional values. All the things we just talked about was designing for shorter trips, um, accommodating transit where you have it, walkability, proximity, mixing land uses and connecting the, the network and creating great addresses and so forth. Those are traditional values, which has added value to downtowns and cities uh, for thousands of years. And the outcome was vibrancy. And that's what you had. Before there were cars in South Bend, you had a vibrant downtown. Um, people were going around in horse and carriages, but there was all kinds of social exchange and economic exchange going on in your city. This is in the 20s. Again, this is, this is an opening for a movie just outside the theater. Uh, Great social exchange. And this is probably 50s, maybe. Again, fantastic um, exchange. Look at, all, look at all the buildings. There's very few surface parking lots. So you know there's all kinds of things going on there. But as we sped up these streets, people, uh, we, we exported the value to the suburbs. Uh, disadvantaging these streets in the retail, people became car dependent, started driving in, and we started tearing down our fabric buildings to make room for surface parking lots which degraded the walkability even more, and, and you had a kind of a spiraling effect uh, to where you are today. So when cities first developed, they developed at the, usually at the junctions of um, rivers and rivers, or rivers and oceans, and there's a, there's a water reason why you guys are here, because of the uh, power generated by the, the, uh, the flow of the river. And so development wanted to be near the river. Elevators and trolleys came along, and, and with trolleys and trains, you could develop along uh, train tracks and trolley lines. And then when the car came along, you could develop anywhere. But I want to talk a little bit about what else happened when the car came along. It just wasn't the car, because you've, you've probably visited lots of cities 
um, that have very vibrant town, downtowns and cars. So it isn't the car's fault, it's how we, the policy environment that we, we provided in those cities. So around 1910 or 1920, this movement came along called modernism, and it came along with a whole set of values. And, and they basically rejected traditional values. That was old fashioned, um, old news. We didn't want to do fancy ornamentation on buildings. We wanted to simplify them. Um, we were enamored with the cars back then. And um, Cabousier, one of the, um, the, the, the architects of the modernist movement in 1924, quote, was quoted as, cars, cars, fast, fast. He, he just loved driving quickly. And his vision for cities of the future were high-speed roads connecting objects in the landscape. And so that kind of thinking became very popular, you know, rejecting those old ideas and bringing this new, better way of living. And this shaped transportation policy in North America dramatically. And, and so measures of effectiveness became levels of service for motorists, speeds, reduced delays. And it trumped all those old traditional values of access, proximity, uh, walkability, and so forth. The tipping point, of course, for this whole type of thinking was at the New York World Fair with Norman Getty's um, exhibition called uh, Futurama for GM. And thousands of people lined up to, to go on this moving um, platform to look at the future city with its what they called magic motorways where you could, you could get between the objects and the landscape in your car. And they didn't really worry about the fabric along the way. And you can see in your downtown those ideas of speeding folks through and not worrying about the businesses and the fabric along the way. You're trying to connect to uh, places uh, further away. And this was where they thought things were going. There's an object in the landscape, and cars were eventually going to go down tubes and things uh, be between, the, between the objects in the landscape. But that never happened, of course. But what did happen was a lot of the policies and ways of thinking shifted, and the role of streets were dumbed down to mobility, which is just getting cars through quickly, and access. You know, can you get off the street onto private property? So the idea was, like I just mentioned, was as an individual, you want to be able to get from A to B quickly. So then doesn't it make sense that everybody can get from A to B quickly in their car? So doesn't it make sense that we redesign the city so that everyone can get everywhere quickly in their car? But of course, that devalued the cities and exported value out to outer areas. And I call it the tragedy of the commons on a, on a city scale. What, what is sometimes in the benefit of the individual, if everyone does it, damages the resource for for the, for the entire community. And that's basically what happened. It was, a, it was very popular individually, but not a very good idea as, as public policy. So remember that diagram? The, the theory behind the conventional um, ideas is that the value is a function of travel time to the center. So the theory was if we sped up the streets, the value of the downtown would spread out um, along those high-speed roads. And of course, that just didn't happen. The, the value down, downtown diminished. And so here's a, here's a, um, a very clear example where that happened. Um, this is um, Broad, Broad Street in um, the, what's the name of the city capital of? Um, oh, hang on. I just got a, a brain freeze. Um, I was just there. <laughs> Anyway, it'll come back to me. Richmond, Richmond, Virginia, that's it. <laughs> anyway, Richmond, Virginia. Um, capital city, very vibrant place, trolleys, um, on-street parking, uh, great addresses here. You look at the buildings holding the street beautifully. Um, lots of social exchange and economic exchange. This is the same view today, that building's that building. And through a sequence of sort of modern conventional interventions, they rewarded the through trip, the car trip, at the expense of the trolley trip, the local the local trip and the walking trip, and basically um, got rid of all their vibrancy through a, a systematic implementation of modern conventional transportation uh, changes. So now, um, a lot of people in Richmond live way far away and they just commute through the city. And there's, there's, this downtown is filled with one-way streets helping motorists just speed on through at the expense of the downtown, you know, similarly to what has happened here. So these are the value sets that led to that decline of, of the downtown, was rewarding the, the through trip, the long trip, the automobile trip, speed, um, the sort of the single use in the landscape, the sort of object in the landscape type ideas, uh, this, 
the slavery to this sort of dendritic hierarchy of streets that you got the highways and the, the big roads and, and they had to have high speeds on those. And, and congestion was thought of as a, a boogeyman, that congestion is inherently bad. And so uh, there was all sorts of money thrown at beating congestion, fighting congestion. And if you think of the best cities in the world, they're all, they're all congested. <laughs> congestion is um, a sign that you're using the, the, the fullness of your downtown. If it's not congested, there's probably something wrong. You've left something on the table. So I've never thought congestion is the enemy. Um, and then, however, the conventional values are very appealing to individuals. It doesn't make sense for society, but for individuals, it's highly appealing. So the outcome of that was uh, diminished downtowns and vibrancy. So if we're going to make a paradigm shift from kind of conventional thinking to traditional thinking, we have a, like a package deal of, of design values, one that supports uh, throughput and sort of long trips, and the other one that supports downtowns and vibrancy. And from a policy perspective, I'd really encourage the community and the leadership to, for particularly the downtown, to adopt a more traditional set of, of values for your design. So when you're envisioning your downtown in the future the way it, it ought to be, think like this. These are two different ways of thinking, and not like that. And you'll probably get investment in people coming to your downtown. So you have to make a choice. Do you, do, you, do you look at your city through that lens or the traditional lens? And what we're suggesting is that if you select a value set, stick to it. Um, and when you're looking at it and evaluating the changes, um, test it based on the, on the con traditional values. Like, are the property values going up? Are more people walking? Do people like the downtown, as opposed to how fast you drive through? And, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at your buildings or your parks or what have you, those, those values ought to apply. So here's a, a, a street change that happened um, along St. Joseph, right in front of your theater. And you can see the, the value set associated with that change was clearly conventional, and consequently, you know, this particular part of the waterfront isn't all that friendly uh, to people, but it could be. Um, here's another one with uh, Jefferson and Wayne. I'm not really sure which street is in here, but it's Jefferson there and it becomes Wayne, which apparently is a, a real difficult wayfinding challenge <laughs> when you're telling people to go up to Jefferson and then it, it stops. Little did you know it continued on the other side of the parking lot. So what we're, this is where the convention center, this, this building is right now. And, we're looking at um, making a connection here, and Andrew's going to be talking about that in a bit. So last time we looked at the downtown, and all the white space is um, generally surface parking lots. So you, you've got an awful lot of parking. Parking's not your challenge. Um, so let's look at the streets. So here's some of our um, waterfront addresses. So you've got some park up here at Leaper Park. You've got a little bit of park here in front of the, the theater. Um, the yellow areas are um, the waterfronts held by the, the housing, the, the neighborhoods, and then this is kind of privatized. So you don't have that many windows left onto the waterfront. You know. So part of this, this thinking that we're doing while we're here is to really leverage these waterfronts. So we're going to really be concentrating on, on this one later today. Here are the one-way streets. So you've got, you got three blocks here on William that are one-way, six blocks on Lafayette, and then up to about the hospital, both... Um, Maine and Michigan are, are a one-way pair that go all the way down um, to the, to the uh, interstate. And you've got the, the, a little one-way pair here on some mostly residential streets up by the hospital. Here's, um, here's a little analysis that we did. Up by the bridge, you know, all the cars coming from the north have to cross this four-lane bridge. And then around the hospital, there's six lanes, and then in the heart of the downtown, there's about 13 north-south lanes, and then about 12 down here. So you've got a lot more lanes in the heart here than the constraint up here at four. If you look at the busiest volumes, if you take all the, add up all the volumes on all those streets, so there's, in the heart of the downtown, there's about 2,500 um, cars in an hour um, going north. And... Um, Right now, they're kind of concentrated on Maine and Michigan and St. Joseph because that they take you to the bridge, right? Very few use Lafayette, but if you could employ all the streets, you know, the, the average 
is like 490 to 710 on a, on a through lane. So a, a through lane can carry between 800 and 1,000 cars in a, in a typical city. So these are really light volumes. So, you could, so this means that you can carry all the traffic, then some, if your streets were just two lane streets. Uh, it's because you've concentrated the traffic on very few streets that they have to be multi-lane. Like right now, if you want to go south, you, you pretty well have to use um, Main Street, right? So if you could go south on all the streets, then um, they could be uh, one lane each going southbound. Southbound, the same thing. If you take the total volume across these uh, lines and divide it by the number of streets, again, it's a, it's a pretty light number. So again, you can, if you spread the loads, you, you, can, um, you can have an, two lane streets. And this is great because then, then you can recycle the sides for, for parking, for bike lanes, for street trees, for sitting areas, for loading areas. You can do all sorts of things that benefit the context, the businesses and the homes and the, the cultural institutions and so forth. So here's basically our theory. So the streets are all two lanes. Um, some of them have left turn lanes. Um, to make it happen at um, where Michigan and Maine come together up by the hospital, we put in a roundabout. So, so if you're coming over the bridge, you get to this roundabout. The nice thing about roundabouts compared to signals, if, if you come to a signal, you're more likely to go through. If you're gonna go south, you probably wanna just go straight through it. You don't want to turn. But at a roundabout, you have to turn regardless where you're going. So you're relatively indifferent where you, whether you go uh, out the first exit or the second one. So you're coming south and you can go either way. Our, our bike strategy is to do a really high level bike facility down Maine, down here. All the, all the streets will be bike friendly, but that will be, that'll have the higher order bike facilities. At either end of um, Michigan here, uh, where, where it's kind of the heart of the downtown, We'd like to uh, make it accessible. It's kind of cut off at the end, so we'd like to make it easier to, to get in here. And then up by Leaper Park, same thing. When you're coming over the bridge, we're going to show you two ways of doing this. Um, one here at Park and one here at, what's the name of the street again? Bartlett. Bartlett. Um, two options here. Again, to distribute the traffic either um, down Michigan or over to Lafayette. Now, we only need like 250 or, or 300 cars during the, the peak hour to, to move over to allow enough traffic to leave Maine and Michigan to allow the, the two-way, two-lane vision to happen. So that's about a car ever in the peak hour, you know, every 12 seconds. So it's not very much traffic, but it, it makes all the difference to, to the number of lanes you have to have. Oh, just before I go about that, there's also why we're doing that, there's a lot of things that need or could be done to the park to help the park uh, become better. And we'll, we'll be going over that in detail. And then uh, coming off of Jefferson, uh, we would like to restore the connection uh, to Jefferson. And we're going to show you some really cool ideas on how that might take place. And then perhaps as part of the, the Western Corridor ideas, um, there could be some kind of entry sequence um, coming in at Martin Luther King and perhaps restoring those streets back to two ways for, the, for that neighborhood. And then if this were ever redeveloped, this is a super block down by the post office. If that were ever to redevelop, perhaps a bit of network would be, would be helpful here to, to again spread the, spread the traffic load. So that's kind of the big idea. And that's where we left off last time. And then people said, well, how do you stage this thing so you don't end up with a, with a problem? So what we're thinking is that one of the early stages could be um, William and Lafayette. It's under city control. It's a fairly straightforward effort. It doesn't require um, negotiating with the, with the state. Um, the second one probably wants to be the Leaper Park area. And, and that's because we want to set up the traffic pattern so that we can start working with the, the state controlled streets. That would probably be the third stage. And then we have, um, these can happen at any time, these other three. but. Um, these three want to be in that order more or less. Um, some of it can happen simultaneously, but more or less in that order makes sense to us. So here's, uh, here's the interstate. Um, there's downtown. We're, we really want to um, attract people investment into the downtown. 
I just wanted to point out, though, that the, the one-way streets go all the way down here, and there's plenty of businesses and neighborhoods which would benefit by those becoming two-way. We heard all sorts of stories about people cutting through McDonald's, parking lots, and alleys, and all kinds of things to, to, um, to avoid uh, being stuck with the one-way system. We, we spoke to the fire department, and they actually have to go the wrong way when they want to make a call to the south. Uh, so there's lots of good reasons to, to um, two-way those streets, but it's a long stretch, and it, it could cost a lot. So we're, we're going to have to stage it. So in the second stage of the downtown, um, the two-way would probably end somewhere um, here between Indiana and um, Sample. Ideally, it would go all the way down. This is where the, the uh, this is two-way down to the interstate. Um, this is where it splits into the one-way pair. And there's Michigan, there's Maine. And, and again, it can be easily done with a, with a, a roundabout. It, fit, it almost fits exactly in that intersection. Um, that's a giant intersection. So that would uh, allow these streets to become two-way. <coughs> in the meantime, though, if we can't go all the way down because of the, just the sheer cost of um, the effort, then we can do it in stages. And so we're thinking that um, around Indiana makes sense to, for the, um, the one-way system to be converted to two-way. So in the northbound, let's say we had to keep this, the, the southern part of the city one way for some time and there's three lanes coming north, we would drop a lane at Indiana and then, um, and then at Broadway. And then by the time you get up to Sample, you've got the typical section for the downtown. The downtown is just right here. In the other direction, you'd have the, the typical section, which is one lane each direction with turn lanes. And then um, you would start seeing some changes down here around Broadway. Um, it would slowly wean off the, the northbound traffic. And, and once you get past Indiana again, it would be one way again. So you pick up and drop lanes. And you have about you know, five or six ways to get back and forth. Um, some will be more popular than others. And over time, uh, this will reach an equilibrium. People will figure out which ones uh, benefit them the, the best. And, the, and it, will, it, will, it will breathe temporarily until it can be two-way all the way down to, the, to that roundabout we talked about. I'm going to talk a little bit about stage two. Um, so we can get it out of the way, because we want to spend the, the most time on the, the stage one projects. But very quickly, this is Michigan. Uh, this is what it looks like now with the 90 degree parking, which I, I haven't found anybody who really likes it. Um, but it's, um, it's the most vibrant part of the downtown. It's got lots of parking. What we're thinking is maybe we could, um, we, we talked about last time about this back and angle parking. It's wide enough we can do bike lanes and introduce some street trees. So the um, you still get a lot of parking because it's 60 degrees, not 90. Um, uh, but it's far safer because you're never backing out into a live lane. And that was the big complaint we heard, that people can't back out. So what, how it works here is you, you drive past the, the, the empty stall, and then you back in. And it's kind of like the first half of a parallel parking maneuver. For those of you who parallel park, the first half is the easy part. It's the getting to the curb, which is the hard part. So you do the first part of that, and then you're in the stall. But the bonus is, is when you're leaving, you can actually see, because the car's pointed the right way. If you're loading groceries, you load them from the sidewalk. Head and angle parking, you load them from the street. So it's got some safety benefits there. And those of you who have children, when you open your door, uh, the door actually blocks the route to the street and channels the kids to the, to the sidewalk, unlike head and angle parking, which it does the opposite, kind of channels them to the street. And it's bike friendly. You can actually have bike lanes and so forth. So it's, it's a, it's a very safe way to provide a, an awful lot of parking in, in, on a street. And you've got the width. Uh, this this is, uses the same width that's out there right now. And then uh, this is Main Street. And so what we're thinking um, is Main Street, is, this is what it looks like now. And of course, you're just focused on the signals as you're driving down this, this car conduit. What we'd like to do is, again, make it two-way with left turns. But then um, do these uh, protected bike lanes. So you get, you get the nice big wide sidewalk and then a bicycle facility on the friendly side of the parked cars. And then at the intersections, um, you, would, you would come out and go through the intersection like a, a normal bike lane. So that would, that would um, be a tremendous boost to the, uh, the whole business environment along Main Street. This would also be the, the main transit route. It's, it's right down the center 
of the, the city. It's within an easy five minute walk of everything in downtown. And then, um, then we talked about, um, someone remind me of the name of the park? It's a John Hunt Plaza. And there's been, Ken, Ken, is Ken here? Yeah, Ken started this. So he, <laughs> so he had some ideas about the park, which we, um, we built on. And um, so there's what it looks like now. There's the sort of big um, kind of highway type curve. There is a plaza up there now. Uh, what we'd like to do is ex expand it way out to here on a sort of upper platform and then have a terracing going down. And so these streets, remember I showed you all those streets up in those northern climates? None of those streets had curbs. And so what we're thinking of is having curbless streets up here so that during events, that whole space becomes a uh, plaza. Uh, you still have a lot of plaza um, spaces in um, non-event times, but you can employ the whole thing as plazas. Even these intersections are raised. So you could do event using the entire space if you, if you wanted to. So that's kind of our big idea for there. And now, um, so that takes us up to basically where we left off. Up, you've got an idea of the staging that we're thinking about and what phase two might look like. So Andrew's going to talk about um, a little bit about uh, how we've advanced that thinking and what we're calling community um, building right now. And then he'll go into um, uh, one of the early, early projects. Andrew? Can you, hear, can you hear me now? Is this, is this great? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, again, my name is Andrew Shepard. I'm an urban designer and landscape Talk architect. Louder. Talk louder. Thank you. When my colleague approached me, when my, excuse me, thank you. When my colleague approached me about Jefferson Street, I was excited about taking on the challenge. As I arrived and we started doing a walking audit and started looking at Jefferson Street, I started knowing, uh, noticing some patterns um, along Jefferson Street as well as throughout the community and the city itself. And after being back at the workshop room, started hearing some different things as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the city and the, and the community and, and some of the elements that are there today. Um, as I walked along As I walked along Jefferson Street the very first day, I noticed that because of the width of the street that there is a great separation between any kind of uses and Howard Park. Howard Park is a great city asset and there's a lot of great benefit to that being located on the river, having the riverfront trails to Howard Park and being part of um, the East Bank Village neighborhood as well as the connections to um, the Century um, building. Um, as well as to the, the river itself. However, because of the Jefferson Street corridor and the widths of the street, that's really become disconnected and it's an underutilized space and it, become, it can become so much more for the community as well as the city. Also notice that we started talking about some different areas of the city with the downtown core being one of those, East Bank Village being another, the hospital campus, and finally uh, Leaper Park. So I started hearing all these different elements and realized that we need to start looking at this as a full community and how each piece of the community works together. So there's six fundamental elements of a community um, in, in our mind. And, and that's from community buildings such as post office churches, civic buildings, a century building, the neighborhoods, there's a variety of neighborhoods, parks and open spaces like Howard Park, the streets, um, Ian's already mentioned a lot of the activities that we've been studying with the streets, the environment, which is the river itself and some of those um, um, nice uh, passive places along the river that comes with it and the trails. And then finally, the, what's, what we call the town centers or the retail areas or the retail aspects of a community. So when we start looking at the actual ground plane and start looking at all these different elements, 
one of the things that we do is we, um, we take each one of these pieces and we start pulling things apart. So in theory, it's kind of like an onion. If you think about an onion and the dried edges of an onion and you start peeling those layers out, you finally get to the, the juicier, fleshier parts of it. But each piece is a layer. So when we think about the layers and how they can actually function, the environment with the river, it exists today already. The parks and open spaces, they have large parks, large open spaces, they exist today. The streets, obviously there's a great network of streets. Community buildings, they're in place. The town centers, there's a lot of retail uh, components and some new components of retail happening in East Bank Village. And finally, there's neighborhoods with Howard Park, Chapin, West Washington, Edgewater Place, a lot of great established neighborhoods. But you start looking at those as we start peeling them apart, each one of those needs to be a system to themselves and they need to work and function by themselves we pull them apart, we look at them, we look at the park systems and how they work together. We look at the river and the environment and how that works together. We look at the function of the streets and how they all work. And then we start building all those things back in place once we've pulled those apart. Another aspect of the community that, I've, that I also heard was that there's, um, there's talk that, that there's the downtown area and, and it's, it, it's a place by itself. And if you look at the downtown area and what is the edge to the downtown, it's really the river. The river is, is considered more of an edge type of condition to the heart of the downtown place. Another place is the East Bank Village and how that works. But if you start looking at what these circles actually mean, these circles represent a quarter mile in distance. And a quarter mile is a very easy five minute walk as far as somebody um, walking in an everyday type of speed. And a quarter mile is typically what one would walk in a mall too, from one anchor to another anchor. So it's a very comfortable walk. So we start looking at the proximity of the river to these districts. And it's a really interesting fact that the river itself, with its history and its culture and the aspect of everything that's located along the river from the parks to the community buildings, to some of the retail, to some of the medical aspects, the neighborhoods, as well as the parks, it really becomes that tying element to this whole community. And what we'd like to propose is that to think through is that the river itself becomes this tying element to everything. So it's one downtown, but it may have different districts within a downtown. So the circle that you see there is now representing a half mile, um, which is a, an easy 10 minute walk. However, within that, you've got all the different elements of the community that I described, and it becomes a great place. So now we want to transition back to Jefferson Street. And as I mentioned, Howard Park is, is the city park that, that becomes very underutilized due to the fact of Jefferson Street coming across. Up here towards the east, Jefferson Street is a four-lane roadway. Really, it's designated as a two-lane roadway, but it acts as a four-lane roadway because due to the striping that's on the pavement today. And there's bike lanes that are associated with Jefferson. But along Jefferson, there's some, um, there's some unique circumstances due to the fact that, the, that we feel that the road is so wide and there's not, um, not any provision for parking on the street that businesses and feel that there's opportunity to put parking in some of the vacant areas between there. So we have a scattering of some businesses that are successful. We have a scattering of some businesses that have a higher turnover rate. And there's parking that scatters along that street. So there's no edge that holds that entire street, which is a shame because there's a great value with this park and everything that can be associated with that park. So, we started looking at Jefferson, and again, this is some of that area where the street, you know, notice there's not a lot of uh, um, shade here for pedestrians. Um, you really don't see a lot of pedestrians on that street. You see the travel lanes coming through, it's very wide. This is the view down to the bridge. The bridge is very wide without shade. There's a lot of travel lanes going across with very minimal aspect of, of pedestrian um, uh, surface or sidewalk to walk on. And when I walked on it, I felt like I needed to walk right next to this railing because of the, some of the speeds of which the cars were going. Even though it's designated as a 35 miles per hour roadway, it seems because of the width that cars were, seemed like they were going much faster. There's also some elements here. This is Howard Park. This is um, St. Uh, Louis Street. 
going onto Jefferson. You notice that there's this slip lane that comes along here. Well, that doesn't help a whole lot as far as the calming effect with traffic coming through and being able to maximize the potential of development that can actually front the park. So if we take a look at the actual section, roadway section for Jefferson, Notice that we've got four travel lanes, two in each direction, that are both 12, 12 feet in width, with a small um, bike lane, a curb and gutter, and then a small uh, tree lawn and, and a small sidewalk. In some places, there, there's trees, and in other places, it's just a sidewalk all the way across. A lot of traffic to cross. For anyone who wants to cross at Hill Street or St. Louis or Niles, it just seems like a, there's a lot of asphalt to get across the street to Howard Park um, and, and enjoy that amenity that's associated with there. So one of the proposed section or one of the options that we've looked at is narrowing the street down to a three-lane section of which there would be two 12, two 11-foot travel lanes, one in each direction, and there'd be a center turn lane for turning movements, of which then we would add a bike lane then we would take care of some of our drainage with what we call a valley curb or a valley gutter of which we can extend either the bike lane to it or we can extend this parallel parking into it. But it helps with the water as far as moving the water to the right places as well in different kind of storm events. So whether or not we take the water from the streets to the park or whether we drain it to um, inlets or whatever the means is in this area, it's going to help some of the new development that comes along Jefferson as well as far as dealing with some of the drainage that's associated with it. We can then offer, um, because of the, the wider um, section for pedestrians, we can offer trees in an urban environment. Perhaps it's a tree well, perhaps it's a tree lawn. Um, and then we provide more pedestrian space that we could have some social interaction if there's restaurants or, or there's opportunities for seating. So um, it provides a great social interaction. At the intersections, when, when I get to the intersections, I'll show you there's bump outs that are associated with the on-street parking. So the distance across the street only ends up being about 30, 32 feet that you're crossing versus the full 50 odd feet that was there before. So it becomes a much more um, enjoyable environment. As we start transitioning towards the bridge then, when, when you see in the plan, as we're coming down to, to the bridge, Ian had shown and mentioned that there will be a roundabout perhaps at uh, Jefferson and Wayne where, that, where the, a new alignment of Jefferson could take place. As we get to the bridge, because that roundabout is there and there's no additional turn movements, we can taper down to two lanes going across the bridge, which minimizes that traffic going across. We can increase the width of the bike lanes to make them feel a little more comfortable, um, keep the curb, but really increase um, the pedestrian zone on the bridge to be at least 15 feet there, of which we could add some texturing or we could add some additional planting or planters. Um, we'd have to look at the support of the bridge to bring in some planter boxes. It may not be trees. It may just be um, some greenery or some shrubs. Uh, it's an idea at this point, but the fact is that we need to soften that bridge and we need to make it feel like it's a more enjoyable environment. So there's a great transition between Howard Park the bridge, and then finally to uh, Century Plaza, and then into the heart of the retail of downtown. So going back to the plan, Howard Park, this is our section going across here. And you'll notice that um, when we get to an intersection, we can mark it, whether it ends up being a raised type of crossing or whether it just ends up being some special pavement that indicates that you've come to an intersection where there are pedestrians that come across. We got. Um, only three lanes of traffic to cross at a certain point, and, and, and looking at the way that the bulb outs work and how the pedestrians can get across the street, it's really taking a look at how Hill Street, how Nile Street, how St. Louis Street can really enhance that public space. Ian had mentioned that streets are, are some of the number one public spaces. Well, streets are something that we want to enjoy and want to be able to recreate to and in as well and they become a connector. They can become a connector from front door to the actual amenities. And by narrowing the street, providing connectivities to the park, you've embraced that now. And it then provides some opportunity for some redevelopment as well as some enhancement of the development that's there. Provide some eyes that end up being on the park. Once you provide that development and eyes on the park, the park becomes more utilized and it becomes a place 
rather than just a placeholder. Transitioning across the bridge, we come again two lanes into the bridge, into the roundabout um, that we're proposing. And again, the bike lanes coming across the bridge. Um, the faster cyclists can go through the roundabout, as, a, uh, as um, Ian had mentioned. And the other bike um, facilities that aren't as experienced, that don't feel comfortable going through the roundabout, can actually join um, the sidewalk, or in this instance, a plaza area, and be able to ride through that and then join back up with the street on the other side of, of the roundabout or through the intersection at Jefferson and St. Joseph's. So I think what's really interesting about the Century Center and the new Jefferson Connection, which really establishes this old corridor through here, is that we can really start thinking how we can take downtown, the downtown core area, and take it out to the river to embrace that amenity and bring that value back into downtown as well. And what we've proposed to do is to rethink or repurpose the surface parking lot that's out here um, without providing only, only providing one access off of Jefferson into that parking lot, but, but create a small gateway type of area and create a flush plaza or a shared space. And Ian had mentioned some of these spaces in some slides before where the curves would be flat and you'd be able to just walk right across there so that you could have art exhibits or extensions of the, of the, the, the exhibits or galleries or spaces here that would extend out into this parking lot. And it could really create an exciting place as you came down Jefferson through downtown, arrived at this, arrived at this plaza space, and you'll be able to still drive through it and connect through it. And if there's big events, there's opportunities to close that down and hold festivals there as well. Now there's components of service that we still need to get back to the Century Center and we've left those in place. It's just a matter of working the trees within the plaza around that and leave those gaps out. But it becomes more of a hidden, it becomes part of the, 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 the overall design rather than something that you have to screen and, and, and hide. Um, so that's kind of the, the plaza area that's associated with it. Um, and then again, it's just extending that street down to Jefferson. So we've got views out to the river. Perhaps there's some terracing that can be incorporated from the bridge that comes down to the river and embraces that. Um, looking at extending some different overlooks off the bridge to try to help um, embrace the river as well as far as viewing. Um, looking at the opportunity of really celebrating the, um, the kayak trail that's, been, that's put in place, the park edge here. Um, the park edge that's it's up by the theater as well. And when you're coming down Wayne Street in the roundabout, with the deflection of the roundabout and the angle then, we offer views then, long views down the river it, as well. So with that then, um, I'd like to pass it back to Ian. Hello? Okay. So um, I just want to point out a couple of things that I'm excited about this. Um, the, uh, this shared space, like if you have a flower show, you can set it up here and um, and operates like it does today. However, most, most days you can just um, drive through. The, um, I just want to point out too that the operation of the parking lot will probably change. Right now it has a uh, a gateway here which backs up onto the street. We would probably suggest a different type of operation so that um, that folks can um, park and then do the operation and have to queue up onto the street. And then notice where the roundabout is. Um, someday this may redevelop this super block and this is set up so that the street can be connected without a lot of um, expense. So it's got some flexibility built into it. And I really like the, um, the views and the terracing down to the waterfront and, and giving the Century Center an address for where a lot of people will be. So Lafayette and William, this, so this is probably the first stage. This is probably something you could do next year, perhaps. Um, William is just a three block, one way street that, um, that goes southbound. And we haven't found anybody who knows why it was made one way. Um, Curious thing, maybe it was part of some other big idea. But it's, um, anyway, it's, it's annoying for a lot of people. They, they have to cut through alleys and so forth to, to get around. 
And then Lafayette is a six block um, one way the other way. So this is the section of William. Again, really wide street. Um, so this is what we're thinking. Um, re relatively inexpensively, we can change, change it with paint and with some bulb on the corners. Um, this is Lafayette, again, wide. It can be changed relatively uh, easily as well. So this is basically what we want to turn it into. You already have it here. Um, so just leaving the street in place, you can have parking on both sides with a turn lane and um, one lane each direction. It will operate just fine. And you don't have that confusing one-way system. So this made sense to a lot of the people from the neighborhood who came in and talked to us. Um, you can get directly where you want to go. These are some of the widths of the crossings, you know, 42 to 52 feet and, you know, 52 feet on, on relatively, you know, quiet streets. And this is, we, we went out in peak hour, so you're crossing 52 feet. There's very little traffic out there if you actually go even during the peak hour, um, but these enormously wide streets. So we met with a lot of people, um, talked about it, we, we toured the street. And when we went out there, we noticed there's 11, um, sets of signals on, on those two parts. Uh, most of those signals aren't warranted. All of those signals cost you money every year to maintain and power and so on. And we noticed a lot of drivers sitting at red lights with no traffic in front of them. I don't know if you've experienced that. Um, I'm surprised more drivers don't go through because there's, there's, I didn't notice any police enforcing any of that either. So. Um, what we're suggesting is putting stops on the minor streets and keeping only three of those. So eight of those signals we don't think are even needed. I don't think they were ever needed. Um, and now you can drive up and down the street without this sort of um, need to keep staring at the signal all the time. So if you're driving east-west, you, you stop at the stop sign. But if you're driving north-south, you just go up and down the street because the stops are on the side street. You know, you don't need all that clutter and, and um, so forth on the street. So this can be a, a relatively inexpensive alteration with far less um, signal maintenance and so forth in the future. And when you look at these signals, there's um, the mass arms are there for three of the approaches already. And so we'd, we're getting eight sets of signals. So we're gonna have some spare parts. Um, so we may use those mastheads to um, finish the fourth approach on those, those intersections. So we think that would be a pretty um, simple retrofit. The streets, again, are very wide. So we're proposing uh, bulb outs on the corners to shorten the crossing distances. And those provide a place for, for trees. So you get what we call that sense of enclosure, make it a much more um, pleasant walk to cross the intersections. So that's, that's kind of the typical idea. So maximize the parking on the sides, and then um, provide a nice place to cross and change the the traffic signals so you're not, um, you're not having to deal with all those traffic signals all the time. So again, there's the, there's the bulb outs, easy, easy crossings, um, some, some beauty with the trees. Um, so three of the intersections would have signals and the others would have just stop signs on the minor approaches. So this is, this is like an overall plan. So we drew some details to give some guidance for the next phase, but basically couple of signals up here, one at the end, and then the rest would be fine with stop signs. So this made a sense to a lot of people and makes a pretty logical, straightforward first phase. So Dave is going to talk to you about Leaper Park. We had, um, we had two park planners come up. Um, Leaper Park caps the north end of your city. It's the big entry into the, into the city. Uh, it's been disconnected because of uh, Michigan Street. Uh, it used to be all one and and, and the Kessler plan talks about how folks could drive or easily around back in you know, 1925 <laughs> when uh, Michigan wasn't a, uh, a barrier. But the context changed. And so, um, so David and Kevin, our two landscape architect park planners, have researched um, the parks and met with the historic preservation people and a lot of people here on uh, taking our starter idea last week and evolving it into two concepts that they'll talk to you about tonight to advance the, um, the original intents of the Kessler plans and um, create more utility for the community, for the park, for the downtown as a whole, and, and for the, uh, the school and the hospital. So I think Dave is gonna take us through, um, through the ideas for the park. Thank you. Oh, the button is right there. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> so as Ian said, um, Kevin and I have met um, with many of you this week to begin to understand the um, um, the history of Leaper Park and its its important place in the um, uh, in the city of South Bend. The 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 city made a very um, bold move um, over 100 years ago to designate the north end of the city as a public park. And uh, interestingly enough, what they did was they uh, identified <clears throat> three areas uh, all together to create a riverfront park at the bend in the river um, where Michigan a uh, Street comes into South Bend as, as the northern gateway to the city. So there's the central area of the park here, which is where the duck pond is located. <clears throat> There's the uh, west, western park, which is where the active recreation, including the, the tennis center, is located. And then over on the eastern side, east of Michigan, uh, is, very, is, is in fact what may be considered the most historic area of the park, because that's where the waterworks of the city, which is so important to the um, South Bend, um, really started with the, um, the wells and so forth. That, um, um, discovered that great resource of water that South Bend has um, and is you know, and still active today with the waterworks facility in this location. <clears throat> so this is a, a survey of the site in uh, April 1915. Prior to that, George E. Kessler is one of the most um, well-known landscape architects in the history of um, American landscape architecture, had come to South Bend uh, after doing very important projects in Kansas City, St. Louis, and my hometown. Baltimore, Maryland, where he designed the neighborhood where I grew up. He came to South Bend and um, to um, develop initially in 1913, 100 years ago from this year, the Parks and Boulevards plan of South Bend. And so that we've been talking about streets, but the, that, that um, it's not only about streets and the, the grid of streets that form the fabric of the city and the neighborhoods and the downtown and so forth, but it's also, as Andrew pointed out, it's about the natural resources in particular of the, of the river. And so it's the, the park and boulevards plan in a, tied the city to those natural resources through open space and parks such as Leaper Park and the, um, and the idea of riverfront, um, riverside drives to pull all of this together. It was an interesting period in time because it was a transition from the horse-drawn, you know, horse-drawn carriage to the um, automobile. So you um, found that this design was really uh, transitional. So at that time when he came to South Bend, what, what Mr. Kessler found was a central park with some water features, a carriage drive that formed a circle, and a few pathways, a little formal garden in the, in a, as a circle in the middle, and uh, a couple of tennis courts, over here, this is mostly open space with some tennis courts and a, and a jogging track or, or running track. And on this side were the waterworks um, with some additional tracks. But you see, at, at that time, the river, river was not part of the vision for the park. You can see this is a very internally focused plan. Kessler um, recognized this important resource, but he also saw its importance to the community overall. So he as you can see in this plan that he developed in the course of a, about four-month period in 1915, he um, saw the importance of creating a much more connected and integrated park that linked all of the elements of the park itself, but also linked them to the neighborhoods and also the places beyond um, the, um, the park itself. So these included um, one element that we've heard a, a lot of people being interested in, which is a, um, a bike trail along the river that would actually allow you to pass under the bridge, which you currently cannot do, but it was part of the vision of the, um, uh, for the park originally. Uh, it, the, this is the, the main street axis of the park um, that, that now comes down to the hospital past Madison Elementary School. Kessler took the idea of the formal garden and expanded it, and he kept the, the water features that brought the theme of water into the park, um, as long as, in addition to the waterworks over here. He kept the um, idea of the, the, the wading pool, which was there up in, um, for quite a few decades in this century. But he used a, a very um, um, uh, beautiful uh, curvilinear system of pathways to link all of these elements together. <coughs> um, 
and, and, and really formalized and created a vision that continues to this day. Um, in what you see today is you still have the um, uh, remnants of a formal garden at the end of Main Street, although now it's, it's um, only the skeleton of it is there. The duck pond is still there. A few, a few of the trails are there. Uh, the f fragments of the Riverside Drive are there. However, there's a, a challenging intersection, so it's very, it's essentially not possible to easily move from this part of the park to that part of the park. Um, and, um, but, and then you have the, the, the um, really su very successful area of the park is the recreation area of the tennis center and ball fields and so forth. So, so all of this is, um, you know, continues to this day to be a very important open space in the city and a resource. And it, um, as a result of his um, vision, you found facilities like the Madison Elementary School locating right next to the park, the hospital becoming a very important part of this end of the, of the town and so forth. One of the, um, and I'll just go back r r just very quickly, one of the um, important elements of the design too was his strategy for tree planting, which defined streets with um, either simple rows of trees or uh, di double rows of trees along Park Lane. But then the trees are grouped uh, around the water features and the trails, but the spaces between the pathways are open and sunny for ball playing and so forth. What's ha what has happened in the, since then is, um, through, I'm sure, very, um, you know, um, through the lo a love of the park, there have been a lot of new trees added, but you've lost that, um, um, the um, uh, access to open space because the trees are kind of uniformly sp spread throughout, so you get a nice shady canopy, but you don't have an area where people can throw a ball or play frisbee as readily as they might um, and have the kids run around. So um, some of our thinking has been about how we might um, uh, address the future tree planting. This is the Michigan Street Bridge, which is that great gateway across the St. Joseph River coming into uh, South Bend from the north. Um, and the desire has been, and I'm sorry this is a little bit dark, but the, to create this bike trail connection under the bridge. And as you can see from, this is Kevin, <laughs> 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 that there's plenty of headroom under the bridge and the design of the bridge, its materials and color, it's, it's actually quite open and bright, and, and it's with, with some improvements to the ground plane with a, 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 a terrace um, that would accommodate a bike path through here, it wouldn't be that difficult to make that connection. This, um, these are sections that were prepared by the Westerly Group, who did a plan for the uh, park a few years ago, and we've uh, benefited a great deal from their work and research um, into the park. So they have um, illustrated here how um, uh, a pathway under the bridge could be created and people could move, move both on the bridge itself as well as under the bridge. And this is something that we would, um, we understand from many people that um, there's a great deal of interest in seeing this happen since now it's very hard otherwise to connect east to west. The duck pond, the duck pond has been there in place for over a hundred years. It's um, it was characterized by one um, one of the people we met with is, is not a duck pond, but a duck jail. Um, <laughs> so so um, we were looking at the duck pond in St. James's Park in London and ways that that, that perimeter of the, of the pond could be um, developed in a more park-like way uh, with, with benches uh, for people to gather and enjoy it and, and, that, and not have such a forbidding barrier as well as such a um, um, uh, sort of uh, 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 uncomfortable environment for the ducks themselves <laughs> and geese. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, in this in this plan that a a Andrew presented earlier with the idea that the, the the downtown area framing the river and the river being the centerpiece of the of the town continuing past Leaper Park. You can see that our our concept is really to think about uh, the whole Leaper Park district. Um, from the hospital and Madison Elementary School up to the Michigan Street Bridge, to think about this as a district of the, a park district where the um, hospital benefits from its frontage on the park, and that the school is really a school in the park. It's not a it's not a, um, a, a park edge, and the school happens to be across the street, but the school is really in the park. <clears throat> 
So this is the first of two um, plans which uh, Kevin and I developed um, last night, <laughs> over the <laughs> last few days. <laughs> or at least we've been developing it over se several days working with you all, but um, the, the drawing came about recently. Um, this is Michigan Street coming in across the river and con um, continuing down past um, uh, the P Park Lane and Bartlett Street here being the two cross streets. Um, in this concept, we take the, uh, the idea of the roundabout, which uh, Ian and Andrew have just been presenting, and, and create a, uh, a, a, um, an, an intersection, but with a roundabout, which is also a gateway feature at the north end of the downtown. Um, this, is at, this is Michigan Street here. This is Park Lane. This is Madison um, Elementary School. This is the waterworks. So it would be just, just, in, just in front of and between the waterworks building and the bridge. <clears throat> so, and then, so you have the option of coming down south on Michigan, come around the roundabout, and you can turn onto Park Lane. And then at that point, this is how you would transition over to Lafayette and to proceed south on, on Lafayette, which we would, um, in fact, transform from a one-way street to a, a two-way street. Um, you could also continue um, around this roundabout and continue south on Michigan, and, um, or even continue around the circle and transition from um, Michigan onto Riverside Drive and proceed this way. So you have all of those options um, associated with that. Parallel to the street would be the bikeways that uh, Ian described with the various ways for the bikeways to parallel the sidewalk and meet the intersections, and as well as to ac accommodate cyclists going around the circle, either in the street or, or along the pedestrian pathways. Expand on Park Lane, I'm just about to do that. The Park Lane uh, is here running between uh, Michigan and the Tennis Center just north of Madison Elementary School. <clears throat> uh, this is the uh, hospital property here where their parking lot is located. So the, as you come down um, south on Michigan, you would, could come on to Park Lane, proceeding uh, west, and then turn uh, south and go down Lafayette Boulevard. The um, design would take a corner of the park here for that transition be um, rather than come into the, um, the, the hospital property and have um, one lane of movement across um, and, and a free turn to proceed south. You could also turn right and go up um, Riverside to Lafayette, which transitions into Riverside, uh, into um, Chapin Park. Uh, we've met with the school and the parking uh, and drop-off for parents and the, to drop off students as well as buses. We've looked at different options for how that would be accommodated on all four sides of the school, um, school grounds. Let us go through both options and then we'll go, we'd be very, very happy to discuss this with you. The, um, As part, of the, um, as part of this design, we're looking at re, um, uh, refurbishing several elements of the park, um, which are historic elements. Uh, one would be ex uh, uh, reclaiming the central area as the garden um, for the park. And we've, the school is very much interested in community gardens for the students. And this is a, a great location immediately across the street from the school for that activity to take place. And the design of the intersections is um, created in such a way with special paving and crossings and so forth to facilitate movements between the school and the park, uh, um, and it, it, um, both to the central area and, and to the west. Um, in addition to that, we would see um, the, the um, refurbishment of the duck pond, as we discussed before, um, maintaining the, the, the major trees in the park, but also uh, reestablishing those pathways that connect all of those elements. Now, one of the most important pieces of this design, uh, and actually of both options, is the idea to uh, 
uh, repurpose this section of Riverside Drive between Michigan and um, Lafayette um, to close it to through traffic. It would no longer be a commuter um, traffic route. Um, it would not have parking on it. It would become a, a pathway as part of a, a bicycle and, and jogging trail and walking promenade for the park that on um, special occasions could be used to support the arts beat with places to park food trucks or, or um, special um, facilities that would be s serving the um, park itself. But the basic idea is that this whole area of the park, which is now dominated by vehicular traffic, would become a, um, an amenity for the users of the park without um, interference with vehicles. Um, and, in, and essentially, it's taking the traffic off of here and, and bringing it um, onto um, Park Lane. So it's taking that out of the park and expanding the area of the park, and it's strengthening its connection to the river. <coughs> um, in addition, we're looking at ideas to add um, an additional connection to the, to the island to um, increase the connectivity and, and flow through for bicycles and pedestrians and so forth. I'll, I'll go on to the second option, uh, which is the Bartlett Street option that um, takes the roundabout further south to this location uh, along the lines of Bartlett Street. Bartlett Street was recently realigned by the hospital as part of its um, 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 uh, redevelopment of the, of the hospital facilities. <coughs> and let me get this. <laughs> so the idea is that Bartlett Street would be straightened out to come to the roundabout in this location. So as you come down Michigan, you would proceed past the park, pa past Park Lane, where you could still turn onto Park Lane, continue south to the roundabout as that gateway feature coming into the downtown, then that would also, um, through the circulation of the roundabout, facilitate movement of traffic that would not only bring you over to Lafayette and to proceed south, but would also provide access to the hospital's front door and um, um, service and, and other facilities, as well as to the, the school itself. So the circulation from the roundabout could come along here proceed south, come into the hospital, or go around the, um, the school. If you're a, a coming down to, co to come to the hospital and want to go into the park, uh, visitor parking, you come to the circle, come by the hospital, turn up Main Street, and come into the parking here. But in the future, we think that as people become more familiar with this facility, they would just come down Michigan, turn onto Park Lane, and come into the um, parking from up here. So they would, you have that option. Um, the, um, to access the parking from different locations. Again, we, um, <clears throat> we keep the, uh, we, the, the idea of the, the formal garden, the duck pond, closing um, Riverside Drive and um, creating the underpass under the bridge um, to make a stronger connection between the um, east, western and eastern sections of the park. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you that, um, Ian will let me give you these things. Okay, so um, there's a couple of traffic things I would I'd like to go over too about the oops about the parks. The um, the first one. We showed you two options. One at the roundabout here, which would distribute a fraction of the traffic there, not 750, but we just need a, um, like a, maybe a quarter, a third of the traffic to go this way. Uh, the, most of the traffic will still go that way. Um, this one, it does the same thing, but down here. Um, either way, uh, we think it would operate safely. And part of it is because we'd like to change the, or change the operation of the school pickup drop-off. Right now, the, the parents and the buses um, use a couple of the approaches here and they mix together. So when we were talking to the school officials, we thought, what would happen if we, we encouraged the buses to use the eastern face and the southern face and we could provide facilities suitable for buses there and then allow the parents to use the other two faces? And they thought that was a good idea instead of having them mixed together. So the parents would probably use um, facilities that look more like a on-street parking thing, but that's where they could do their pickup drop-off. And when the school functions weren't 
being used, it could be used for parking. In the meantime, the buses could um, use appropriate facilities on these two faces. So that seemed to be a pretty good idea f um, to, get the, to get things rolling. Right now you've got, um, like I said, buses and um, parents mixing together. The, um, I also wanted to point out the Brick Street. There's, there's a, a history of Brick Streets here, and one of the nice things about Brick Streets is they, um, they provide texture and keep um, speeds under control, but they also create a, uh, a nice ambiance on the, on the park. The roundabout also here creates a really nice connection east-west, so you can get from the, the pump house or the park across both ways easily as a pedestrian. So you could cross up here, or you could cross down here, but here you can cross in the middle as well. And if this is flooded, which it will be some time of the year, um, it gives you a way to connect the east and west of the park. So, so that's a plus. The downside is there, there may be 250 more cars at, during the peak hours arriving around here, 250, 300. So that's, that's a car, an extra car every about, um, what, 10 seconds or so if you do the math. So you know, not, not a high volume, but um, enough so that it allows us to use two lane streets in the balance of the downtown. This, of course, brings the entry feature further down and um, reroutes the, the fraction of traffic we need to go into Lafayette to allow the imagination of Maine uh, and Michigan to happen down here. But we don't have the, the easy crossing in the middle, but it, it is down here. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons to both options. Uh, we think both are, are feasible, both are safe. Both help the park in, in a number of ways and both help the hospital. And we think, um, the school will come out ahead in either case as well. So some are, are more for one than other. So there's some pushes and, and pulls on this. But this requires a, a, a bit more community discussion to see where things land. But I think uh, either way, you know, all the different stakeholders uh, come out ahead. So with that, um, just to summarize, we talked about um, Lafayette and, and William a rather straightforward, cost-effective change down here. Uh, we have two options for Leaper Park. Um, again, there's pros and I'd, I'd say pros and cons for both both ideas. I think we both groups or both ideas advance the the interests of everything up at the north end of the city. And then we have some earlier, uh, sort of more preliminary ideas for Phase Two. But those so we've fleshed out sort of the Phase One type ideas and. Um, <coughs> and uh, have given much more detail in the, in the first phase. 